the University of Hong Kong for 28 years. He was the head of two community colleges affiliated with the University of Hong Kong in the past eight years. This talk is based on one of the lectures in the course Science and Technology of Ancient China that he coordinated for the Hong Kong University. And so today, telling us all about astrometry in ancient China, please give it yeah, up. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So as mentioned, um, this talk was actually part of a lecture series for a course on uh, science and technology of ancient China. I taught at the University of Hong Kong for the general education program. Now, but the course was not that much about surveying the science and technology achievements in China, but rather to raise some questions for discussion. We know that, you know, in many areas like in uh, uh, herbal medicine, in astronomy, and in mathematics and metallurgy, etc., there were some quite some achievements in ancient China. But the questions in, in our mind is uh, the way the ancient Chinese made those observations, analyzed the data, and how they pass on, the, or, you know, whether those methods were, you know, in modern sense, scientific inquiry method in nature. You know, because in a lot of times when we read about the literature, say, on uh, on the Chinese medicine, it almost seems like we only read the last chapter of a research thesis with the findings. And then we don't have any idea how the ancient Chinese went about collecting data, you know, analyzing data and uh, scrutinizing that data at all. And the other thing is, uh, you know, that it will likely become more apparent in the um, later part of the talk is um, how the Chinese pass on data. They made a lot of observations, but how did they go about passing and transferring those information from dynasty to dynasty and from generation to generation? Okay. So, um, my talk is on the astronomy of ancient China. Oops, it's not advancing. Okay, now I like to, um, you know, um, explain a little bit the difference between the two words, astrometry and astronomy. And everyone knows, you know, what astronomy is. But astronomy is more about just observing and studying the positions of the um, celestial objects at a, a certain time. And, you know, many of you probably recognize that this is uh, the constellation, the Great Dipper. And then the, we have the, you know, the stars in the Chinese name. And inevitably, in some parts of my talk, you see, you come across some Chinese names. And I trust that the majority of no of you probably read Chinese anyway. So <laughs> now, but then uh, I, I like to use the, the, um, the next 40 minutes or so, you know, to talk about these um, basic topics like the one particular term that I will um, mention quite a bit is the word Sing Guan, which means star groups or constellations in uh, the more common sense. And then I'll talk a little about the historical developments of astrometry in China and the earliest star maps and the star systems. And also some of the oldest uh, astronomical records, as well as the political and society context. Now, there are several terms that I like um, to highlight. One is the word Sing Guan, and which is essentially like constellation or a group of stars. Okay. And in China, you know, instead of giving uh, the constellation some fancy uh, Greek names, you know, 
um, they named the Chinese Xingguan by some of the earth, more earthy characters, like maybe certain animals or maybe, you know, certain ranking in the uh, government um, office. And um, by the third century, there were already 283 Xingguans or uh, constellations, as well as uh, more than 1400 stars recorded in the Chinese literature. And these star groups, the Xingguan, the star groups, are actually divided into two kinds, not according to the nature or the shape or the geometry, but by their position. And uh, we call them the Yuan, which is like enclosure or a wall or a castle, as well as the seals. The seals are like mansions or, or hotels, okay? So they are all together in the star system in China, three yuans and 28 seals. 28 seals, that means 28 star groups and each represent, you know, a group of star along the ecliptic. So basically, you know, every time, you know, a certain period of time, the sun um, is at a certain location along the ecliptic and they name the group of stars behind the sun, you know, a particular seal and which means um, the sleeping place in Chinese. So that is where the sun resides, you know, for that particular period of time. And interestingly, they also group the 28 seals into four groups. And then the four groups each comprises seven seals or seven star groups. And they name each group by, you know, um, mystical animal, like the dragon, the tortoise, the tiger, and the bird. And supposedly these four animals or these four groups of stars, they control the four seasons, the, 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 the weather condition, you know, the fortune um, and the welfare of the four seasons. So in essence, the star system or the Xingguan in China comprises three yuans and 28 seals. What are the yuans? Now the seals are basically the group of stars that are located along the ecliptic, which is the path of the sun, you know, across the, uh, the sky. But there are a lot of stars that do not fall on the ecliptic. And so they group those stars into three uh, system and they call the enclosures or the yuans. And so they are together, three yuans and uh, 28 seals. Now such description probably dated back to about 400 BC. So, and then the, the oldest uh, Xingguan map or the star maps were devised by two guys. One is called Shi, Ji Shen, and the other is called Gan, Gan De. And, um, but they, they, but they, they do not, they did not have any written or graphic record or of their star systems. It was only until almost 200, 300 years later uh, that their, um, you know, star system were grouped into a map and combined into or recompiled into a single map called the Ganshi star maps. Okay, that was about uh, 500 um, uh, AD, actually earlier than that that we know. Now the the oldest known sort of a physical um, illustration or description of the Chinese star system is in this silk description dated back to about 200 uh, uh, BC. And it's probably the oldest uh, relic of uh, astronomical records. Although just last year, they claim to have found, you know, Hippocrates uh, star map. Uh, Hippocrates uh, basically mapped the entire sky, uh, the entire sky, all the all the constellations um, 
in the um, hemisphere. And um, there was uh, published in uh, last October, I remember. But then uh, the silk description was comparable in, in terms of time to Hippocrates' uh, description. Although there were actually evidence that the Chinese observations dated back much, much older that I'll talk about later. But also in the uh, silk description here, they talk about the five planets, mainly you know, the, from Mercury to um, Jupiter, uh, to Saturn as well, as well as uh, there were description on some of the um, synoptic cycle, like they already described that the planet Venus had a sort of a synodic period of about 584 on four days. We now know that, you know, our current estimate or measurement is 583 for 92 days. So they are actually quite accurate and very close to, um, you know, what we know uh, for the time being. And um, this, uh, Artifact is um, on display in the Hunan Museum, and then and you know and then a, a, a very important uh, figure who sort of uh, summarized the early history of China is by the name of Sima Qin, and uh, he lived in the around the um, the century before Christ, and he put together a book, a record of grand historian in Chinese called Xi Ge, and then a wood recorded almost uh, uh, 3,000 years of history uh, before Christ. And of course, many of those are sort of uh, legendary and not really um, considered proven history. But then in uh, his book, there was a uh, the particular volume on the book of celestial office. And then the, he described in detail some of the Sing Guan invented or the devised by the earlier people. And this is considered the first systematic chronicle of the star systems in China. Now, this is what, um, in general, what the uh, Sing Guan map or the star map looks like in China. And this, uh, this piece is now in the British Museum. And you could see that there is a group of stars on the side, and then there are several long um, sort of a chain of stars in the middle. And the chain of stars in the middle are called the Yuan, okay, like a wall. And those on the side are called the seals, like a mansion or hostels or uh, hotels, you know, that's where the sun resides, you know, um, during the time. So, and um, this is uh, found in the um, archeological um, sites in uh, Western China and now kept in um, the British Museum. And this uh, British library, uh, consider one of the more comprehensive description of the star systems in China. Now, in addition, there were also quite a number of astronomical findings reported in the ancient Chinese literature, including sunspots. They already noticed that there were dark spots on the sun all the way back to about the second century BC. And then um, in um, about uh, 6,000, um, about 600 BC, they already noticed that there were comets. And in fact, they described the Halley's Comet back at uh, about 613 uh, BC. And in the book, uh, Chen Chao, which means the annals of the spring and autumn. And later, another um, person, he actually managed to work out the return period of a uh, Halley's Comet to be about 76 years, which is very close to the modern estimate as well. And then there were numerous dis dis descriptions in the Chinese 
uh, literature on meteor showers, you know, and um, they, they, you know, they consider meteor showers a jinx, something of bad luck. And so anytime they happen, there were uh, extensive uh, uh, description and record of the uh, events. And then uh, supernovas, and there were at least seven supernova explosions um, recorded in the Chinese literature in those days. And uh, one particular one that uh, many of us know about is the 1054 one, which is associated with the Crab Nebula. And uh, that, that supernova explosion and, um, was so bright and it lasted for two years. And they called in the, they recorded in the literature these supernovas as guest stars. Okay, they're not always there, they're the guest star. And uh, another one in 1572 was also so bright, it was even visible during the day. Now, those were the written records in literature. What about the instrument? In fact, you know, they had um, the armillary spheres, which are the celestial globes, you know, that are used to measure um, the angle of the uh, celestial objects. And the first one, the first armillary sphere, according to Joseph Needham, who uh, studied a lot about ancient um, Chinese literature, I mean, science and technology, was probably invented about 4th century BC, but that um, has been contested. Okay? And then uh, we know that the first real uh, confirmed armillary sphere was built by uh, Lu Sa Hong about 30 BC. And then, um, and later, you know, people refined it and then uh, Zhang Hong. And this is a very important guy, Zhang Hong, who lived in around the first uh, century. He is a scientist and astronomer as well. And then he invented the first seismoscope. I studied geology, I studied earthquakes. So we know that the first seismoscope and a machine, an instrument to detect the occurrence of earthquakes actually dates back about two thousand years ago and was invented by Zhang Hong. He also built a water-powered armillary sphere. So using, you know, um, water energy, using essentially gravity to get a self-propelling armillary sphere that could, uh, you know, uh, rotate and move at the same time as, uh, you know, as the rotation of the uh, celestial sphere. And then this is what we um, know about the mechanism of that water-powered armillary sphere. And most of the time we only see the top part of it, you know, which are you know, like a, a lot of uh, these sort of like gyroscope like uh, 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 rings, uh, you know, following the ecliptic, following the equator, and then uh, with certain angles that could be internally, that could be rotate um, to follow certain uh, star system. But inside, this is probably about 10 meters tall and uh, with uh, a water wheel, sort of uh, with uh, also gears and some kind of uh, uh, driving chains and then to keep the, uh, the sphere uh, moving. So. Now, so there were machines, there were uh, records, and then, the, um, and this is uh, what the um, seals um, look like. And then what we are showing here is the path of the sun, the ecliptic. Okay. And then each of these are essentially a star group, the star group, and they are given a name. And you see that along the ecliptic, the 28 seals are organized into four different groups and given in different uh, uh, circles. Some are solid and some are red. 
etc. And so, and because not all stars fall near to the ecliptic, so when we look at the entire star map, there are 28 singles that fall along the ecliptic, organized into four different groups. And then there are quite a number of individual stars that fall within the ecliptic and they are organized in three sort of a, like a castle like a war, a warlike um, a group, and we call them Yuan. The word Yuan in Chinese literally means a war, a castle war. So there are three Yuans, or that means three castles, and 28 mansions. And this star system has been dictating the astrometric observation and description of Chinese um, um, astronomy for over almost you know twenty five hundred years, up to the last early last century, they are still using uh, this sort of a system up to the Qing Dynasty. And then the four groups of seals, each comprising seven, are organized into what we call the four symbols and each represented by one of the um, mythical animal, a short dragon, a black tortoise, white tiger, and a vermilion bird. And then each of them is governing, considered to be governing one quadrant of the uh, complete circle with the dragon sort of uh, controlling the eastern side or the spring, and then the uh, tortoise controlling the northern side, the winter, the tiger controlling the western side of the autumn and the bird on the south. And the words or the names given to each of those seals of star groups are like this, which literally translate into certain organ or certain part of the dragon in this case. And then uh, each of them also have, um, you know, um, one of the major stars that are, you know, you can probably recognize some of the equivalent um, symbols. Now, a comparison of the star chart that we are more used to with the Chinese one. The one on the left is the Western uh, star chart, and then uh, this is the Chinese one. And you could probably uh, recognize the Taurus right away. Taurus is there. And then this is uh, Orion. And then in the Chinese one, they both fall on the tiger on the Western side, with this as being the, uh, the Taurus. And then the Orion is located there. So the so Orion would not be one single uh, constellation. It's actually divided uh, uh, between two different star groups. So, but we can make some comparison between them. Now, such star system supposedly um, go back to about two or three hundred years BC. But in fact, there are evidence that they actually go way back, much, much farther back than just a three century before Christ. And there are two lines of evidence. The first one is um, from one of the tomb, the tomb of Marcus Yi which uh, we know very well um, is stated at about three, uh, 433 BC. And then there's a piece of warlord. The Marcus is a warlord, one of the, basically the cousin of the emperor. And then when they unearthed, when they excavated the um, tomb, 
they found a lot of uh, very interesting artifacts. Among them, like there's a set of uh, bell. And I, I actually talk, uh, I also talked about the acoustic in ancient China. And these belts are very interesting. And they were buried for over um, 2000 years. And it's very complete. It's very complete and they can still be played. And in fact, they were uh, put out and then uh, with a public performance for, um, uh, for three times. The bells are very interesting because they have a secret that was only uh, discovered about uh, 80 years ago. Is that instead of each bell producing one tone, one pitch, the bell can produce two different tones. You know, if you strike it at one point, it gives a, a particular tone. And if you strike it at another point, it gives a different tone. So in it almost seems like if you have a piano and uh, instead of having the full, um, I don't remember, 88 keys, you know, you can actually play the same music using half of the uh, piano keys because you can, each bell can play two tones. And also um, the bells have a damping mechanism such that, you know, they can, um, there's a, uh, you can play music. Yes? Uh, do you know when the bells were like first found? The bells were found um, 3,000, at least 3,000 years. Oh, okay. yeah, even before then. So in my, this is a um, um, tension of, you know, because I, I found a lot of uh, interest in this. And then um, the bells are very well made. And then they were designed such um, design such that they will not have resonance when they play it. You know, when you play the, you know, when you listen to the Camelina, you know the bell, each bell has their natural frequency. And uh, they can, the, the resonance can go on and on. So that's not good uh, in playing a, a, a song of music. But if they have a natural damping mechanism, then you, that means that each uh, pitch can die very quickly. And so that allowing the music to be played. And uh, they did so very geniusly, you know, ingeniously because they have this sort of a, what we call nipple on the surface of the bell, which is a, a way to offset the, um, the overtone a little bit so that they won't have uh, the frequency. So, but this is another topic. But anyway, um, in addition to some of these, oh, another very interesting finding from this tomb is they unearth a saber, a sword, okay, a sword, and then we we know that that was used by the king because it was an engraving on the surface of the sword, and it belonged to the king. And when they unearthed it, it was still sharp, in spite of it's been buried for two thousand years. And they can just cut 30 pages of A4 or letter size paper, you know, a stack of 30 letter size paper, just like that. And no rust at all. And when they analyzed the composition of the sword, they found that the center part of the saw has a different uh, copper to um, pin ratio than the edge. Near the center, the copper ratio is higher. The percentage of copper is higher. So that when you copper it, it's more flexible so that they can flex the sword. But then the edge of the sword, they have a higher tin content, so they're sharp, okay? And how exactly could they make a sword with two different alloy in the same process? And it was only until some 20 years ago that they could, sort of uh, duplicate the, the method, you know. They, they, it's been a puzzle, you know, how can they make a sword with different um, uh, copper to tin ratio for, you know, in the same sword. So, but what I'd like to uh, address today is that they also found a chest from the tomb. It's an ordinary container, a chest used by one of the, um, you know, arist aristocrats. And then, but on the chest, they notice these patterns. And these are basically the star pattern, the seals. 
and then they have uh, something similar to the yuans in the center. But these are the star charts, the Xingguan, which means that the Xingguan, the star system that we know that was already existing during the second century, probably date much farther back to the fourth century because uh, the tomb um, is um, the age of the tomb is 433 BC. So, so by then they already knew uh, uh, many of the star and their positions. So this is a, a picture of the 28 seals. And more than that, you know, and another even more stunning discovery in 1987, there was a, a, another tomb, an archeological site that belongs to Neolithic age, probably about 6,000 years ago, that was being excavated in 1983. And in the process, they unearthed one of the tombs, like the tomb, they call it the tomb 45. And very interestingly, the tomb has uh, still have uh, several uh, uh, bodies, skeletons. And then this is probably the, uh, the body of a child. And then there's the body of the master. And what is interesting is it, you know, next to the corpse, next to the body of the master, there are two animals. One is in the shape of a tiger and the other in the shape of the dragon. And they were arranged and laid down with seashells. So in other words, the concept of the four fortunes, the four symbols, the dragon, tiger, bird, and tortoise actually went way back to Neolithic time, 6,000 years ago. In other words, people were already making astrometric observations way back 6,000 years ago, you know, much, much, much older than what uh, we thought. But, and also at the near the feet of the body, we notice there's a group of uh, shells and two bones. Uh, we do not know exactly what that represents, but there are speculations that they might look like the arrangement of the stars in the Great Dipper, you know, the Great Dipper, okay, which is sort of like a look like a ladle. But then, thousand or eight thousand years ago, the seven stars of the Great Dipper had a different arrangement. So there are speculations whether these bones and shells were arranged in a manner to represent the stars in the Great Dipper, you know, way back um, several tens of thousands ago. You know, we don't know the answers, of course. Anyway, okay, so we know there were a lot of very interesting um, astrometric. Um, um, observations and records made in ancient China, okay? But uh, what I like to also to raise is that, how exactly did they make those observations and how exactly did they record the data? We knew that, we know that in the government throughout the, the various dynasty, astronomy was put at a very important position. They have special officers in charge of astrometric observations because they needed those detailed and meticulous observations for a number of reasons. And the astronomer, which is a government officer, would keep track of the sun, the moon, and all sort of planetary positions and they record any astronomical phenomena observed. Meteor showers, sunspots, and supernova explosions, etc. For them, it's very important because for China, 
for Chinese, the king represent, you know, the only person who can connect with heaven. You know, in Chinese, the king literally means the son of heaven, Tingji, son of heaven. He is the only person on earth connecting um, with the sky, with the heaven. And they also need astronomical, astrometric observations to calibrate the calendar and the solar terms. They also need the astrometric observation, the data, to sort of um, make predictions, predictions of wars, predictions of, say, natural disasters, natural events, well-beings of the rulers and the officers. So they rely very heavily on the astrometric data. And because, you know, astronomical data are very important, and that's why only government officers were allowed to make astronomical, astrometric observations, and it was recorded. Anyone who practiced, you know, um, astronomical observation, like if you do stargazing on your own, you will be put in prison for two years. Okay? And that was by law. No civilians can do any, uh, you know, uh, private uh, observation of the sky because it's uh, infringing on, on the right and the power of the of the king right. so that's the, the questions uh for my course okay so how did the ancient chinese go about making and recording astrometric observations of course they do it by eye they may be using some uh the the celestial globe to help them you know uh, measuring the angle but is that enough Okay, like for example, we know that there's a concept called precession of the equinox, and which is basically, you know, the, every time the, um, the sun returns to the same period and the tilt angle of the sun is slightly different. Okay, the precession period is about 26, 25, 70, 72 years. So about 26,000 years. It's very important because we know that this is the period. This is the cyclicity that controls our climate. Why we have Milankovitch cycle, why we have uh, ice ages is because of this uh, precession of the equinox at that 26,000 uh, years period. But way back, you know, about uh, the fourth century, they were already able to determine that the precession has a period of 18,000 years, which was later um, improved to 27,000 years. And then by 1199, they were able to um, demonstrate that the precession has a period of 24,000 years. Now, exactly how they go about doing that. You think about the amount of uh, movement of the stars over one's lifetime you know it's less than um you know one percent of an arc second so there's no way someone spending every night stargazing can tell um you know how long the precession could be so we do not know honestly there are some questions that we still trying to figure out and how did they go about passing on the data from dynasty to dynasty. If they did so, there must be record. And then we look at the entire lit uh, collection of literature and we found no record of such um, uh, description and observation. So exactly how they felt went about doing that. So these are some of the questions that are um, uh, very interesting for us. And that, you know, in my course, there was the, uh, basically the, the focusing question for discussion and with that I thank you for attending my talk tonight. Thank you.